the humming in my ears. Welcome back, everybody. I hope that you are enjoying your conference so far. Once again, I am Bettina Maynard, the president and CEO of AHL. I am a longtime AIA Honolulu member. It is my honor to be the moderator of this hour with a great discussion with Sierra Bainbridge. But before we go any further, I have been asked to share some quick housekeeping notes. One, you will see at the bottom of your screen a, a Q&A box that you can ask any question you may have for our panelists and where our staff will make sure that I receive those questions in time for the Q&A session. If you are experiencing any technical issues, please contact our tech support team at the number you see here. Actually, I might have to call them. Um, after this session is over, we have a special surprise that we want everyone to stay tuned in for. So at the end of this, please hang on for a little longer. Lastly, the session qualifies for AIA Learning Unit, and the AIA Honolulu is a registered provider. Uh, all attending AIA members will have the credits applied to their transcripts within 10 business days. If you are not a member and need proof of participation, please contact the AIA office. Um, so, before we start the program, I wanted to welcome and introduce one of AIA Honolulu's very generous sponsors without whom events like this one here would not be possible. So please help me welcome Brittany McLean, the Director of Membership for SOURCE. Brittany is here today to share a little about SOURCE and their introduction to the Hawaii market. Brittany, it's all yours. Thank you, good afternoon. I've been really grateful to be able to attend many of the wonderful sessions alongside you guys this week. And I really hope that you will walk away feeling challenged and inspired by the speakers and panelists that you've heard from over the last two days. I certainly know I have, and, and we'll be thinking about it um, as I go into this next week. Um, in case you missed my introduction yesterday, I'm Brittany McLean. I'm the Director of Membership at Source. Uh, Source is the world's largest marketplace for discovering, comparing, and purchasing commercial building products. Our digital tools and human powered services are here to help you from discovery to delivery. My team supports our members who are architects, designers, and contractors like yourselves. And as mentioned, we're very excited to announce that Source will be opening a resource center and library showroom in Bishop Square in downtown Honolulu this October. As a part of our opening here, we will also be bringing a more sustainable way to source commercial material samples. So whether you order samples from us online or you're using our digital catalog or you come in and take them out of the library itself, when you're done with them, we'll come pick them up anywhere in the Honolulu metro area for free. And then after proper cleaning, we really inventory those samples and give them their next big shot at another project. And we believe that by sharing resources locally, we can help keep literal tons of material waste out of the landfill and also provide the community with a wider selection of materials that you can get um, your hands on same day. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it back over so we can continue this conversation on sustainability with our closing keynote. And again, thank you to the AI team for a wonderful event. And I hope to meet you all at a future um, event in person. have to unmute myself. What a rookie mistake. Brittany, thank you very much. And thank you for the support. I now have the pleasure of introducing our closing keynote speaker, Sarah Bainbridge. Sierra began work with Mass in 2008, focusing on landscape architecture and joined full-time in 2009 to finalize design and oversee implementation of the Butaro Hospital Mass's first project. Currently, 
Sierra directs the ongoing design and implementation of MASS's planning and architectural project and is overseeing the Kayanya Center, an academic facility supporting rural health care delivery and research in Uganda, a number of African conservation schools in DRC, Tanzania, Zambia, and Rwanda, and the Butaro Hospital Expansion Plan, among others. Those completed include the Butaro Hospital, the Umubanu Primary School, the Butaro Doctors' Housing, and the Butaro Ambulatory Cancer Center. Welcome, Sierra. We are truly excited to have you join us today. The floor is yours. Greetings, hello. I uh, hope you all can see me. I wish I could see all of your faces, um, but it is such a pleasure to be here today. Um, and uh, so exciting to get to know everybody at AA Honolulu who has made, has made this possible today from um, Bettina to Melanie to others. Um, thank you so much to Brittany um, and your team for sponsoring and I'm just so excited to share this and hopefully, um, hopefully it's useful and interesting to everybody. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and Bettina, I'll rely on you to let me know if um, if there is anything amiss and you can't see it. Um, sharing now, and then I'll just go into presentation mode. And so hopefully everyone can see this. Um, so again, thank you so much uh, for having me um, to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing. Um, first beginning in Rwanda and then um, moving back into the States um, over the last, uh, since 2009, so 12 years now. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just tell a little bit about how I started. This is a little bit of a blurry picture, but it's what I could access. Um, I graduated from school and started work. Um, I have an architecture and landscape architecture degree and I started work on the High Line. And I'd always wanted to do work that um, served the greater public, and at the time there weren't a lot of firms that were were doing that. It was kind of the um, zenith of uh, star architecture, and there just weren't a lot of firms that were thinking about how can we be of the greatest service to our communities and to our public. And uh, however, in parks, you know, doing park design, um, you know, as a place where people can obtain respite and take a break and and connect with nature. Um, these, these were happening, there were landscape architects who were, who were doing that work, and so I was lucky enough to join field operations and um, be one of an amazing team of designers to uh, continue completion of the design after the competition and then go ahead and build it. And I spent the days walking, I, I would get off the subway at 14th Street and have the opportunity to actually walk up the construction site every day on my way to work, which was at 10th Avenue, um, and just watch this amazing space go from a, a um, underutilized, um, antiquated piece of uh, city infrastructure and then become this amazing, beautiful park. I finished section two on June 15th of 2009 and on July 4th, I flew to Rwanda uh, to start my work there. Um, I had been working on the Butaro Hospital project. Uh, sorry, these are some um, images of uh, what that looked like. So, so initially this was um, this beautiful, beautiful place, but, but inaccessible. How do you take that, um, transform it and make that landscape actually more accessible, but retain some of those beautiful qualities? So again, I went to Rwanda in about 2009 and I started in 2008 um, while I was working at field operations, helping out with some site work, um, but working with Michael Murphy and Alan, who had uh, both were in school at the time and realized they'd actually not quite ever built anything and maybe they should um, get some assistance from someone who had while they went back and finished their degrees. And, um, and so I and some others came and started to um, work there. Rwanda is a very small country. Um, as you can see, it's an island in this huge continent. It's totally landlocked um, and is in the very north of the country. Uh, Butaro is in this northern district that you see here. Um, the district is called Barrera, and it is also on this other massive lake that runs right through the middle of it. Uh, and at the time when we started there, there was no, um, there, there were no hospitals and, and there were some health centers, but if you needed to have any kind of major um, consultation uh, other than primary care, you would have to take 
walk for a very long time and potentially take a boat across this massive lake to Masandi. And so the, the um, as they were developing coming out of the genocide, um, uh, President Kagame requested Partners in Health and Paul Farmer to help him build a hospital in this, um, this final district that, that was the last district that did not have a hospital. And what you see in front of you is what was a military site during the genocide. Um, and actually during construction, there were armories found, uh, un, un, um, exploded uh, munitions were found as well as graves um, amongst here. But it was this amazing transformation of a place of um, combat, a place of conflict into a place of healing. Um, and I, that, that's happened on many, many sites throughout Rwanda and, and, and rather intentionally. Uh, and so we went and worked alongside and learned so much from Partners in Health during our time there. We really thought about uh, disease transmission was a major driver here. This was pre-COVID, but working in a place with high levels of tuberculosis, which is an airborne transmitted disease, um, we worked with experts and really learned about how do we take advantage of this amazing climate, right? It's a place that is around 70 degrees year round. Um, in fact, sometimes cooler up in the Northern regions. This isn't a really mountainous area um, of the Varunga mountain range. Uh, and, and, and in fact, we don't need to have interior hallways, um, which are places where generally uh, waiting would happen and you would have um, enclosed spaces where you would have the transmission of these diseases. So someone might come in for a broken arm and they might leave um, with some other illness that they had contracted um, from someone there in the hallway. And in fact, during our research, we found um, you know, some, some extremely uh, challenging cases of this uh, in South Africa with tuberculosis, um, especially in Tungulu Ferry, where 52 people um, came in uh, to a hospital for treatment of other uh, issues and left with uh, MDRTB, which is multi drug resistant tuberculosis. So working with experts around this idea of airborne transmission, we really thought about how can this hospital in this amazing climate actually rely on natural systems and so you can see we've put all the waiting spaces outside um, up here in this beautiful landscaped area. We've taken out all of the central hallways, put them on the exterior um, in these beautiful covered walkways. And then as well, really tried to open up um, the, the spaces of the, uh, the wards. Um, ward systems are really common in Africa because there is such a level of brain drain. There are amazing doctors, clinicians, and nurses, but a lot of them get trained out of country and don't necessarily return home. Um, and so there isn't a high enough level of staff to actually retain and have private rooms as we do in other places, as well as the kind of social benefits of actually being with other people while you're healing. However, typically these beds would be along the edges of these rooms. And so it would lift up the, the windows. It would make them much smaller, much darker rooms, less ventilation, and you'd be sitting and facing um, other sick people across the room from you. So we worked with clinicians to just reverse this and have all the patients looking outside, either across into the beautiful landscape, this is a land of a thousand hills, or looking into the interior um, beautiful courtyards. Hey, Bettina. Sierra, I am so sorry to interrupt you. We, yeah, seem, to okay. have, <laughs> we seem to have uh, some technical difficulties. Okay. And we were wondering if you could uh, put earphones on okay. um, with a mic that might help. The, we're getting... Um, Comments from com comments from the audience that it is hard to hear us. I'm so sorry. Okay, let me see if I can make this work. Give me one second. I'm going to stop sharing while I give me one second. Oh yeah, no no problem. I really appreciate this. I'm so sorry. Um, the other thing I can do is just lean in really close and talk really loudly. But let's try the mics first. And see. Actually, I usually keep a mic with me, but as I'm traveling, I didn't, I didn't bring it. I'm sorry to say. Actually, that that last sentence you were saying, it sounded perfect. I think we're going okay. in the right direction. Okay, I just put on my earphones. Does this help at all? This is good. Hugely, yes. Okay, I think okay, so. Excellent. Oh, okay. you're wonderful. Thank you. I'm so sorry, and let's keep going. Um, yeah, let's go. Okay, so we're back. Thank you so much. Thank you for interrupting. I want to don't want to spend an hour with people not being able to hear. <laughs> um, so this is uh, what we did was we came up with this idea of a conduit wall in the middle that would bring um, our oxygen, which has to be at a four foot height, which is another thing that shifts the windows up. 
um, and as well data, um, uh, electricity, and other future services that might come in um, that are needed in, the, in, in uh, hospital treatment areas. But in addition, it allowed these beds to face these beautiful um, views. Uh, we have ventilation, natural ventilation up here with these louvers, which are not able to be closed. So it is open all the time. Um, we also have what are called um, industrial fans. They're actually called big ass fans. <laughs> they were all donated by this amazing company. They lift the air up into the planum, into this upper region, where it's treated by um, these uh, ultraviolet um, air treatment systems, uh, light treatment. Um, and so with the operable windows on the lower level, the inoperable louvers on the top, we have constant airflow at a minimum air exchange to ensure that we have minimum um, disease transmission. Transmission. Also, we put in these um, built-in uh, um, tables and storage areas next to each bed, which prevent people from, you know, in, in overcrowding, pushing those beds closer and closer together so we can maintain minimum spacing. And again, all of this was before COVID. The other thing that we learned from Partners in Health was their amazing ability to source uh, and train, source materials locally, um, always contracting to local uh, uh, contractors and through those contracts, also creating some kind of thresholds where we had a minimum of 50% employment of women-owned businesses. Um, so in fact, all of the CMUs that you see in the foreground were, were um, poured on site um, by a particular uh, contractor who was, uh, which was a women on contracting um, and CMU production business. Um, and as well, they trained on site, we had master carpenters, uh, master electricians, plumbers, masons, who trained throughout this process. Um, so they would hire um, both skilled labor to support them, but then unskilled labor that they would train over the course of the project. Uh, in addition, we learned about rotational labor, uh, wherein instead of hiring the same 200 unskilled architects to do lots of the heavy labor that has to happen, such as um, uh, excavations, um, instead we rotated those um, every two weeks to one month, depending on the season, um, which allowed us to employ 4,000 people from the region, um, which was uh, a much higher number than maybe would normally have been uh, employed through one project. In addition, we use this local material. So this is the volcanic rock, which is found in the region, which is considered kind of a nuisance rock um, from, a, from an agricultural standpoint. Uh, it's usually just piled along edges, walls are made of it, um, just to get it out of the field so that um, crops can be planted. Um, and because it's so porous, it isn't really considered a great building material, but we looked at using this as a veneer for um, the, the substructure uh, and worked with these masons to over time kind of develop and through mock-ups figure out how we could utilize it in, in a really beautiful um, way. And it was really wonderful working with them and um, you know, throughout the process, their skills and the kind of meticulousness with which they did that and, and improved so much that by the time they got back around to the front of that same building, they said, can we redo this wall? Like our, the work is so much better now. Um, but of course, you know, we left it. It was, I think all the stages of that um, were really quite beautiful. So at the end of this project, you know, at the beginning, we, we weren't necessarily an organization yet. Um, we were certainly learning all of that initial work was uh, pro bono work. Um, but, but we took everything that we knew and we created this organization called um, MASS, which stands for uh, Model of Architecture Serving Society. Um, and through that, really try to think about how can we take all of our skills and bring them to bear for uh, and bring access to design for communities that may not have had access to it before. And what are the mechanisms by which we do this? We realized and understand that design is never neutral, it either heals or hurts. And so we have to pay close attention to all the designs that decisions that we make along the way and think about what is the impact that they potentially could have but might not be having at the, you know, based on one set of decisions, um, or making sure that we're avoiding harm um, by any of those decision making. Our mission is to research, build, and advocate for design that promotes justice and human dignity. So we're now um, so we're about a, a, over 150 designers, and we've also started a non-profit uh, contracting business in the same way to kind of make sure that we can provide uh, careers for people who are in the allied professions. Um, but how do we actually bring the best 
uh, design and construction to our partners. And we found that like we have a huge amount of ability to kind of increase our agency in the design and construction process um, by actually doing that work um, and controlling it um, from the scale of even a uh, tile or um, furnishing all the way through um, the full built work and, and on into infrastructure over large um, sites. But our first and largest and longest running project is the design of our practice. And, and even that kind of uh, decision that we've taken the last two years, our kids are a few years ago to, to try out and think about what it might look like to have a, con a contracting business that is not for profit, wherein uh, we take that 15% and we push it right into the project um, uh, is one way that we just continually try to imagine uh, and think constantly in this kind of critical way of how are we how are we succeeding, where are we failing, and how do we do the best to bring design to our partners? And and we're constantly kind of re <laughs> rejiggering and and tweaking our, our practice in an effort to do that. So now we have um, our our um, four main offices currently: Santa Fe, Poughkeepsie, Boston, and our first office, which is in uh, uh, Kigali in Rwanda. Uh, but in addition, we've these are all of the, the places where we have built work or ongoing work um, yeah, under construction currently. Uh, and again, the things that we, we learn and, and have started to develop as a, as a way of approach um, include the idea that um, we think uh, about the potential for systemic change. Um, and so we each project has a mission. Um, we are a mission-driven firm, but we also understand that each and every project serves a different purpose for each of our clients, and we spend time in the beginning of our project um, thinking about what is the mission of the project and what is it going to do to amplify the work of that partner. Um, we are uh, immersed in context, meaning, you know, of course, in Rwanda, we committed to being there where, where you've been there for over 10 years now, and we'll, in our office there, we'll remain open <laughs> so long as we continue to have work. Um, it's our largest office. We have about uh, 80 um, architects, designers, and support staff there. Uh, and um, being there allows us to, to, over time, learn our context and, and make better and better decisions about how we can source materials, how can we can utilize um, local skills and craft, and how do we um, create designs that hopefully impact the next um, wave of, of buildings that are built there to be built in the best possible way. Um, the question is um, not if we're having impact, but in what way and by how much. So really thinking as we're going through this process, and I'll talk a little bit about the impact design methodology that we developed based on the theory of change in, the, in, the, in a few slides. Um, but really thinking about the idea that every project has the potential for impact. And, and through the design process, every decision that we're making actually is a decision about impact. Uh, and so the question is, how do we track that? What do we decide is the potential of each project that we really want to push as far as we can? How do we invest upstream? And so that's kind of, you know, understanding where our projects are coming from. You know, if we're going after RFPs, which is certainly necessary, and we definitely do that, but that definitely is also serving communities that already communities or organizations or schools or, or partners um, that already have access to funding. If they're at the point where they're having an RFP, they've secured the funding and they're ready oftentimes to do the project. Um, we're also trying to create networks um, to meet people who are interested in doing amazing work to do really impactful work, but haven't yet quite figured out how architecture is going to be a part of that. And we work with them to help them figure that out. How much is it gonna cost and how are they gonna make it happen? How are they going to maintain and operate something like the building um, once it's built? And finally, that justice is beauty. Um, obviously, the name of the monograph that we have currently, but just really kind of doubling down on the idea that we all have a fundamental right to a beautiful world, both a beautiful landscape, beautiful buildings, uh, and that that in itself is justice. Um, we talked a little bit about, or I mentioned before, this idea of the impact design methodology. And, and this is really a tool that we developed to think about how do we have conversations with our partners where we can bring to the fore, um, bring to the table and share all of our ideas about what a project could be and through hearing each other um, and sharing those ideas come to a shared understanding of what this project could do. So what is the fundamental goal of the project? What does success look like? What are we actually doing to achieve that? And that's in, over here on the right, that's really where we think about design. 
Can you hear me? Oh, no, not again. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, All right, so you, I have you might have to. Um, I think you might I, have to speak directly into your microphone, Sierra. I'm going to do I that. I'm really sorry. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. I also just realized that my video is, I turned it off when I was, so I'm going to be really close to you all. I hope that's okay. Does this help? Right now, it sounds good. Okay. I'm not going to move. I'm just going to stay very close. My apologies for everybody um, to have to Thank look at you. Um, okay. So um, method is, is what we do. This is what architects do, landscape architects, designers. These are the pieces of the project that we're actually gonna build. Um, this is the place um, where we bring our skills to bear to serve that mission. Impact is, you know, how, what, how is this going to um, potentially, uh, oops, sorry, I skipped one. Um, there are many, many methods by, by which we measure impact and each of those are tied intimately to the mission and to the methods and what we possibly can achieve on each project. Um, whether it is training, whether it is um, uh, what we're, what's going on inside of the building or the project. Um, and then finally, systemic change. What can happen potentially outside of the project because of this project happening? Um, and so, you know, one example of uh, systemic change, say for Butaro Hospital, was the idea that once we built this hospital, the uh, Ministry of Health started to kind of understand how design can actually create better spaces for clinicians and patients, and that in that in doing so, create better services for patients um, and a better place for clinicians to be able to do their work that supported their work and made them able to do even better um, for their patients. And so they asked us to take on, and I'll talk about this a little bit later as well, um, looking at um, uh, uh, directives and guidelines for the, the construction of health infrastructure in Rwanda. And so that's an example of one project potentially influencing the policy and the systems of, of, a, of a country. And so we look for that in each of our projects. What is the potential systemic change that we can create? Um, and it could be something just like this material, um, volcanic rock seen as a nuisance rock. Um, now we have um, not only uh, the, the, the mason that you saw in that image, but also a woman named Anne-Marie. There's a, we have a video of her, um, her name is Conquasi um, locally. And she started a cooperative uh, for women masons. And now they're all, uh, she's about 12 to, 20 female masons and they've been building um, buildings throughout their community. Um, and as she describes it, paying for their school fees and being able to kind of improve their own homes. Um, and so even something like changing um, and creating a need and desire for this material and then training people um, in ways of using it um, creates a, a really potential amazing impact. We also learned about, you know, what it means to work locally, hire locally, source regionally, uh, invest in training and uphold dignity. And so this is something that we call low fab construction. Um, and, you know, I think was the way that we approached almost all of our projects. Um, but, you know, things have changed since we started work in 2009. Um, you know, at that point, an inconvenient truth had been out for a few years, um, but there really wasn't the same kind of understanding of what we were up against when it came to climate change. Um, and in the meantime, you know, I had the opportunity to work on some other projects. Um, this is the Equal Justice Initiatives um, project, which is the uh, Center for Peace and Reconciliation in uh, Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, and this is a memorial to um, remember and uh, recognize the over 4,000 um, lynchings that took place in the South from the Jim Crow period. Uh, from the end of the civil rights all the way through the Jim Crow period and, and up to um, even through the 80s. And all of those names are rem remembered here in a way that they have not been acknowledged anywhere else um, in history books, um, you know, politically um, and, and throughout the South. And so this, this was an amazing, amazing project, obviously, to, to have also had the opportunity to work on. But then, you know, you know, we're speaking now of kind of like projects that we consider seminal, at least testing out and coming to kind of a new level of understanding of what design and architecture can do. Um, EJI for us was, you know, really about this potential for systemic change um, in our society to kind of acknowledge and um, bring to bring forward histories that have um, been intentionally 
kind of um, subverted or, or ignored over time and how important it is for us to come to terms with those in order to move forward. Um, and then this project is the Rwanda Institute of Conservation Agriculture, which, which has become, um, I think, seminal for us in its acknowledgement and understanding of the work that we have been doing up until now and how that could come to bear on a project with the idea of um, our uh, need to address the carbon, um, uh, carbon, carbon issues and climate change in the future. Um, so I'm going to take a little time to talk about that now. I mean, I think just have a picture of my son here, which is obviously all of our, you know, those, in addition to the work that we do, many of us also have kids um, and those become their own projects. And I think future generations um, are really what we're building for and designing for now. Um, how do we become more and more responsible about the work that we're doing so that our um, kids can inherit a place that is um, as wonderful and uh, awe-inspiring as the place that we live in today. We all know um, that our, our goal here is to try to limit our warming to 1.5 Celsius if possible, which may be out of reach. We might be looking at 1.75 now if we look at the most recent reports coming out. Um, and the goal is that within 10 years, we're able to have our current levels of um, emissions. And so one of the things that we started to understand um, through a number of projects um, was that the way that we were working, um, this focus on local training, this focus on um, regionally sourced materials, uh, all of that actually had a carbon um, footprint. It actually uh, had an impact into the way we were working. And so when we started to kind of apply this thinking um, to the work that we were doing, uh, and understanding and seeing also the work and, and kinds of projects and, and learning our context and region in Rwanda, um, realizing that the, the systems that we think are the most modern um, are not necessarily the things that we need to carry forward in order to protect and preserve our futures here on this earth. Um, and so you can see that, you know, we were thinking about ways of doing this tropical architecture um, or sometimes called tropical urbanism, which came um, and has some amazing and beautiful examples throughout um, throughout Africa and particularly in East Africa in Nairobi, um, Dar es Salaam and other, and other amazing cities has been replaced by this uh, kind of somewhat Western influenced desire for, you know, systems that create kind of a, um, a very even temperature. But it's, it's really interesting in Kigali where you have a, a kind of temperature that's almost perfect, <laughs> 70 to 75 degrees year round. Um, and, and if we could rely and learn and master and um, better utilize our natural systems of both lighting um, and he, uh, cooling in our buildings, then we could avoid all of the materials that you see on the right, um, as well as spaces that are generally much less comfortable um, than, than those that we're able to occupy through natural climate. So I want to revisit for a second um, the, the Butaro Hospital, which I kind of introduced initially as the place that we learned everything that we learned. Um, but looking at it through the lens now of um, operational operational uh, carbon um, and you know the fact that taking these things so you know it's when we started to actually do uh, um, design guidelines for uh, healthcare infrastructure in Rwanda you know one of the things they asked us to do is like let's just take Butara hospital and we'll put we'll put five more of those all over the country but Butara hospital was built very specifically for its site. It was at the top of a hill where we have a constant Southeast breeze, except during storms when that shifts a little bit to the kind of North or North, uh, south, Southwest or, or Northwest. Um, and uh, uh, also kind of had like beautiful views. This would be a very different hospital if it were built in a city where you might have buildings around you, you might have not be at the top of a hill, but on the side of a hill. So your opportunities for natural ventilation would be much different. So what we did is we built up these interiors um, that created um, guidelines on like uh, adjacencies. What were the right adjacencies that, that we, we would wanna have? Um, what are the correct flows for things like uh, dry, dirty and clean linens, um, materials, equipment, where you should you clean it, all of these things that we that we must do and that we must learn and, and be able to replicate, but allowing for, and that covered about 60% of the design process, but we really wanted to allow for 40% of the design process to be site specific, that 
for each and every site, we need to actually make sure that the building is responding to the things that we know. Um, what is its solar orientation? Um, which side of the hill is it on? What are the prevailing winds? Um, prevailing winds are a little bit harder to work with now that we know that winds are multi-directional, um, uh, oftentimes when, uh, with kind of less predictable um, climate futures. Um, but working with groups like TransSolar, um, really focusing on that. And so we in included that as something that would be site specific. Um, we worked with Mazzetti and TransSolar on, on really uh, helping to apply some of these systems of natural ventilation and as well natural lighting. Um, and so we were able to kind of ensure that that was happening on multiple projects. And so the two projects that we built since then, based on those guidelines are Nyaragenge District Hospital, um, where we worked again with TransSolar to look at uh, the system of um, air flow through that hospital and then New Redemption Hospital. This one is in Liberia, where we also did uh, their um, healthcare policy infrastructure, um, which we finished, you know, unfortunately in December, um, just before Ebola broke out um, in early of, I think it was uh, March that year. So they didn't really have a chance to kind of implement um, any of the findings of, um, or guidelines of that healthcare infrastructure and was part of the reason that that, that uh, things were so difficult uh, in Liberia because their, their healthcare infrastructure was um, quite limited at the time. This is a hospital that's um, nearing completion uh, and is will be their new um, and largest um, public hospital in downtown uh, in Monrovia. And you can see these chimneys um, uh, as one aspect of what we were thinking about in terms of ensuring that we, you know, a very different shape hospital, a very different site. This is a flat site right along the ocean. But how do we make sure that we're relying on um, natural systems of ventilation? Of course, for certain areas, we do have um, mechanical ventilation for those that have to be cooled constantly, where we have um, me medicine um, or me medication storage in the pharmacy, um, some of the ORs and, and other areas where we, we have to have climate control. Um, but for most of the wards and, and other places, we worked again to kind of find and find a way to have um, natural systems. You can see the shading along the side of the buildings to keep um, things cool on, on those that are oriented. Um, uh, to the uh, west and I think the, sorry, the west and the east and then, or the north and south. And then we also have out in the, um, in the wetlands, uh, another approach was from the landscaping perspective. A lot of wetlands are, you know, when you come, when it comes time to develop the, um, what, what feels like the best approach is to just fill the wetlands and then build on top of them. And we've seen that time and time again, but as we know, wetlands are um, some of the kind of purifiers and uh, cleaners of air, um, but, but certainly water um, uh, that moves into these other larger systems. And so what we wanted to do here is demonstrate a way that we can create um, and, and ensure that a wetland when it is intact and when it is healthy um, is, a, is actually not uh, a place where mosquitoes will tend to stay, that we worked with ecologists and we worked with civil engineers to find a way to ensure that um, we could have this as a, as a beautiful amenity um, and also as a, a, a working ecological um, system, um, but that would not bring any game, uh, harm or danger to any of the patients through uh, mosquito-borne illnesses. Uh, and so that's currently underway and, and hopefully becomes, uh, you know, a demonstration and um, uh, one, one piece of, of a potential argument for why um, wetlands might not be filled in on another site um, and rather perhaps turned into an, an amenity. Again, we looked at our wind and ventilation, solar, thermal comfort and design um, with uh, TransSolar. Um, who we to to ensure that we had um, a high level of comfort in all of our buildings, but using primarily natural systems from these amazing chimneys um, that we find throughout the campus. So that was a little bit on like how have we taken um, uh, the learnings from some of our projects in in Africa, especially through this idea of operational carbon, um, and then now focusing on where we what we've learned um, from the standpoint of embodied carbon. Um, and again, what we found when we started looking at our projects and, and analyzing them from those metrics of, uh, you know, how much carbon have we utilized on projects. When we looked back at Bhutan Hospital, it was about half the carbon for this typology in the region. Um, it's about 250 kilograms of CO2 per meter squared. 
Um, and we began to realize that um, what we had been thinking about uh, from the labor standpoint, this idea of low fab and the potential of labor uh, is that, you know, in alignment with the way that architects have been thinking for a long time, but have perhaps forgotten and, and, and is worth kind of recalling um, that labor is such a key part of how we create our buildings uh, and that the extent to which we can use um, communities, labor, contractors that are adjacent or near the, the areas that we're working, um, it brings the kind of greatest amount of benefit, a sense of ownership and um, kind of pride in the creation of resources that their community can use into the future years. Um, and this project is Alima. So this is where we learned really about the potentials of operational carbon and, uh, sorry, embodied carbon. And it's not because we, at, it's not because we like did a bunch of research and figured it out. This project actually forced us. Um, it is a site with um, the African Wildlife uh, Foundation, um, wherein they create covenants with local communities to provide um, different kinds of resources um, in, in, a, in, in exchange for the reduction of uh, impingement on key um, wildlife corridors and wildlife areas. And so this is to protect the um, dwindling area of the bonobo gorilla, um, which lives in, in the Congo um, forests. And so they built this school um, to provide other alternative uh, futures for economic um, uh, growth and careers for students and people from this region. Uh, and we, in order to get to the site, you have to take two flights um, and it's a day, one day for each of those flights and then a six hour motorcycle ride. So the idea of bringing materials here, um, the barge to bring materials would, would, would be ordered about six to eight months in advance and it takes about three months to get to site. Um, so the idea of bringing materials in from the outside seemed like it would be um, a burden actually to the maintenance and upkeep of this place in the future and also kind of potential misplacement of the possibility of the resources and money that's coming in to build this building going somewhere far away rather than coming directly into this community. So when we went on site, we spent a lot of time um, uh, on site and working with um, different community members to identify the carpenters. We found when we were there and we saw all over the place, the most beautiful furnishings, really amazing um, woodwork and wooden structures. And we were able to kind of find those master craftsmen and, and work with them, work with uh, master masons and ask them to come to this community where there actually wasn't um, the same level of craft and train um, look, members of the local community in carpentry, in furniture making, in vannery, which is the caning that you see on that on these windows. And so we and we also looked at the kind of uh, mud bricks that they were using and worked with Arab to figure out what are there any local additives? What what is a way that we can take this thing that everyone is using on their homes and make it more durable? Um, and it's much better than. Uh, burnt brick, which is what was another alternative, which is used in some areas nearby, but not in this one in particular, um, which is super high carbon footprint. But this is earthen brick that's sun dried. And by adding uh, palm oil, which is locally available, they were able to increase the durability by something like 26%. And so um, that makes a big difference um, in terms of the amount of maintenance that's required for each of these places. And so those are the kinds of little tweaks that we try to find what the local knowledge was and then bring and enhance it in, in very simple and accessible ways. Uh, and so we ended up with fuel um, from wood that was harvested and put on site. Um, the trusses were also cut on site. We brought in some steel tube from Kinshasa um, but that was that was the majority steel tube and some threaded rod and nuts and bolts was the majority of, of what was brought in. Laterite blocks, all of these materials were sourced within um, within 100 kilometers of Alima. And um, and of course, all, all of the funding, all of the money that went towards this project was spent um, on those on getting those local materials to site on the kind of labor that was used to build the building. And so, of course, we found that between that and both our and other schools that we had built in Rwanda um, using more typical methods, and then as well the global averages, that the construction of this building was 28 times less the carbon um, of other um, buildings in this typology per meter square. So, um, what we found is that this 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 project really pushed us to understand and 
um, see the potentials of what local sourcing and local labor can do. Um, this is all of our projects. And, you know, again, as we started tracking them and started to understand what um, carbon impact looks like, um, aside from, from one uh, somewhat <laughs> out, of, out of alignment project, you know, all of our projects were really below the global average, um, if not half the global average um, across typologies. And what we've, you know, where we've landed today in terms of how we describe this way of working is what we call performance and provenance. Um, the idea that we focus on performance, which is uh, natural ventilation, natural lighting, um, ensuring that we have um, safe and breathable air in all of our buildings um, from a COVID perspective, which is kind of like our most recent um, kind of lens of, of looking. Um, and then as well, we think about provenance, which is where are materials and labor coming from and what is the potential um, to have positive impact throughout that um, supply chain. And so I'm gonna dive into the Rwanda Institute of Conservation and Agriculture, um, which we um, have found to be two fifths of the global average for a university. This is um, a new university. It's about 40 hectares and 50 new buildings. Um, but all built, 95% um, 90, 95 built of materials sourced um, within Rwanda and within East Africa. Um, this is the, the trying to understand what the farm of the future might be. Um, Rwanda is a place that um, has as many, with, with increasing population, um, as many places have throughout the world, um, has massive def deforestation. Um, since 1990, you can see on the left, all the green um, is prior forested areas and to the right, all of that has turned white and has been turned over to agriculture. Um, super important to kind of provide food for the millions of people living in Rwanda, but of course, along with that deforestation and change in land use, we get erosion, um, we get the removal of the wetlands, and we have um, um, all kinds of um, fertilizer and pesticides and other things that are now not being able to be filtered through the wetlands and going into and reducing water, uh, water quality um, in the lakes and waters there. So we came to this project with the idea of One Health, which is this idea that human ecological and animal health are inextricably intertwined and that uh, we need to attend to all of them, that um, if we come at it from this perspective, we can prevent zoonotic disease transmission, which is a source of COVID, um, regenerative agricultural practices, which allow us to have food security far into the future, harm no species, and um, attempt to have sequestration. So taking kind of typical conditions of monocultural crop testing, livestock grazing, which are quite typical throughout Rwanda, and thinking about how do we multiply and diversify how we're using the landscape through agriculture. And what we wanted to do is make that really, really present on the campus. So as students are learning about all different types of agriculture from dairy, poultry, swine, row, um, and forage crops, veg and um, tree crops, that they're also seeing ecology adjacent to all of these and understanding how, how inextricable they are from each other in order to have productive um, food far into the future, we need to have um, productive and healthy ecologies. We did all of this deep kind of research into the site, topography, scope analysis, ecology, all the stuff that you all do all the time um, and really utilize that to make some determinations about what we were gonna do on site. And one of the biggest things that we did was convince the, the our partner um, uh, to save the Savannah woodland, woodland. So this is one of the few intact Savannah woodlands in Rwanda outside of the National Park, Akagira National Park. Um, and in fact, when we finally did a carbon count, um, uh, after we, or you know, late in the project, we're still not quite finished. It should be finished by the end of this year. Um, found that this was obviously, you know, an untouched or somewhat untouched and somewhat healthy woodland was our biggest carbon sink and really contributed to offsetting the carbon of the rest of the project. Um, in addition, we kind of were um, expanding, uh, saving as much wetlands as possible and expanding some of those natural areas. And so that really helped us understand where would be the best place to site this so as not to disturb these amazing assets that we have. And then also take advantage of the land, you know, where is it most fertile, where is it least fertile, and where do we locate um, growing and grazing um, in response to those. Uh, and so we landed the site in the north of this area, as you can see, um, and um, had the main growing campus right alongside the river, right alongside the Savannah Woodland, which is an educational um, uh, um, amenity. 
um, and then allowed for agroforestry and grazing in the areas that were most um, uh, uh, the least uh, functional ecological areas that had a high level of um, both um, overgrazing and uh, um, exotic plant material that needed to be removed anyway. And so we took that analysis and again, we turned it directly into the design in, in terms of the location. Um, we started by designing these first year farms. We also kind of designed the curriculum. Um, we, when we started this project, they didn't have an educational partner yet. And we thought it's really, really hard to design a, a, pro, a school without understanding how it's gonna support the curriculum. And so we developed a three year curriculum with the knowledge that in this, in this part of the world, um, agriculture is a year round. Um, endeavor and so they're actually on campus for 12 months out of the year so they can um, be there for all of the different aspects of the growing season but they finish in three years the first year is about the first year um, uh, sorry the the shareholder farmer in Rwanda and so it's about taking this average size of a uh, Rwandan farm and learning how to farm that area and then taking that knowledge into the second and third years which are about processing and food um, at food out value add, um, whether it is taking dairy from um, at one end of the building from um, straight from the cow and um, milking the cows and then turning it into yogurt, cheese and other things, or in this case, um, bringing all the vegetation in and um, doing value add processes of drying or jamming and juicing all these things that allow for longer shelf life and, and more diversified uh, products. And so those are um, a number of um, uh, um, enterprises that are spread around along the rest of the campus where students in their second year are learning all different ways of farming. Um, and then in their third year, they do a capstone project where they think about as the future kind of agriculture entrepreneurs of Rwanda, where do they want to focus? What type of agriculture? Um, where do they want to start a business or become advisors to the local community? And so as you can see, it opened in 2009. We have um, cows, we have students, um, we've been going in and out of the bubble there um, to help with COVID, but they've been maintaining classes all along um, and mixing in with some of these views of how phase two, which is currently underway and should be completed by the end of the year, um, will leave the campus looking. This is the campus center, which is currently um, under construction with this huge open air um, uh, dining hall, which really gives you like direct visual access to the landscapes where all their food is coming from. And so, you know, this is where we took everything that we learned from Alima and tried to apply it here um, on a project in Rwanda. And so we managed to have 96% of our materials sourced, um, sorry, with, within Rwanda. Um, and again, it's two fifths of the global average. We are 100% off-grid and renewable. Um, and we tried to look at each and every building component to understand how could we get it made in the most local, lowest footprint way. Um, and so we thought about our structure and began to work with um, some of the local timber industry. They have had forestry there for um, over a hundred years and um, worked with our engineers to figure out which of those forests and woods were going to be stable enough to turn into buildings. Um, all, all, all of the structure, the external walls of the buildings are um, rammed earth and all of that soil was sourced on site. Stones and aggregates were within one to 10 miles. Um, and then we went further afield to East Africa for some of the other things that weren't available locally, including cement, um, structural steel, doors and windows, reinforcing steel, and then even a little further for um, sanitary wear, light fixtures, et cetera. And then there were a few things, um, especially specifically to our solar array um, and some of our other treatment systems, waste treatment, um, and then some areas where we did have gypsum came from a little bit further afield um, in the Middle East and, and China and Europe. 90% of Wika's labor was sourced within 100 miles, and those other 2% are mainly contractors and designers um, who are working on site. Um, and so we were able to employ um, hundreds um, and into the thousands of people on this site. And then the most wonderful thing was working with over 80 different cooperatives and crafts people, um, sourcing all of our tiles for the commercial kitchens and all of the bathrooms throughout the, the private bathrooms and kitchens, the weavings, the furniture was all designed specifically for this project and, and working with all local craftsmen to build. And so that's all great. So we've tried to manage to create this project that is super low carbon, that's using earth and timber from within really close, um, really low embodied um, footprint. 
Um, but you're never going to be positive because you're still transporting that material to site. There are still some things that like cement and steel that have, that do have a footprint. And so how do you manage that? And so that is where we kind of came back to the landscape, which we'd initially looked at as um, our main resource and, and that all siting should be kind of in a, with an understanding of that as our main resource. Um, but how do we actually, um, again, conserve the places that are the most valuable and then reforest and um, restore wetlands um, to enhance that um, in setting and then as well use the landscape across the entire site. So we actually collected, um, I don't actually know the percentage yet, but we're in the like 95% of all of our um, plant material was sourced um, from collections from on site and then grown in our nurseries on site. Um, and then again, just the, the students arrived and that allowed us to get to a six year, um, six years until we are uh, carbon neutral um, with the implementation um, of the reforestation. And so we're working towards that now. Um, and we had all of those, I mean, we're at the cutting edge, especially here where our ability to have, um, we, we actually went through the process for our um, tiles for the roof to get uh, the carbon um, uh, kind of officiated and approved carbon um, number calculation for that, that material. But we don't have calibrating calcs for, for a lot of the things that we're doing here. And so we've been working with Atelier 10 who did kind of a peer review of all of this and, and, and confirmed that actually we had Kind of been really conservative and assume that we'd be there in like 20 something years and they said that we would be um, hopefully carbon neutral in six years assuming that we're able to do the reforestation um, that we've been planning to do and so these are the students getting on site and, and actually kind of building out the longest farm future and so i'm going to wrap this up now i think we're um we i have a few delays but i'm going to try to wrap this up in the next 10 minutes and the big question is like great so you can do that in rwanda but how do you do it in the United States? <laughs> How do you do it in a place where we already have so many systems in place? Um, we have so many ways of building, of working, of creating things. Um, and where we, we actually, you know, there in Rwanda, when we started working there, there weren't a lot of guidelines. There weren't um, building codes to, to speak of. Um, even for the hospital that we were building, there, there were no hospital building standards. And so that actually you know, while we try to be extremely responsible and build things in the most safe way and do the research to ensure that would happen, um, it also leaves a huge amount of opportunity for uh, for innovation. And so what do we do when we have all of those systems that are already at play? Um, this is a project in the Hudson Valley, which is with the um, Hudson Valley Farm Hub. And they are an organization that is looking at de-risking farming for all of these massive family farms that have been producing food and farm for hundreds of years throughout the entire Hudson Valley. Um, but, you know, are still often living um, kind of season to season. Um, they are uh, um, at risk from flooding, um, from all the natural disasters that we're encountering more and more, and also just the kind of difficulty in, in creating a living as a farmer. And so their, their hope is to kind of um, test out all the new methods of farming. How do we kind of link ecology and, and productivity um, and do that at their at, with their own resources and share those um, learnings with other farmers so that they don't have to take those risks themselves but can benefit from um, the kind of knowledge that comes from that kind of research, whether it's um, uh, um, equipment, um, whether it's testing of new crops, or whether it's kind of looking at this like direct linkage between ecology and productivity. Um, so here we're looking at how do we use these tools of stormwater management, right, riparian um, buffer, wastewater management. Um, that would be kind of like our landscape hope, but really we wanted to understand, could we, at a site that is meant for growing and is um, really trying to innovate there, could we think about a way in which we cut um, our all of these um, emission sources by getting all of these things on site? What if we actually grew the buildings? Um, and so we kind of did this typical um, uh, analysis again of like, what is the typical uh, carbon footprint of this building type, um, which you can see on the top. Um, and what is masses average for this building type? And then what if we got to zero? What might that look like? And how do we, again, look at each element? We looked at foundations, structure, insulation, 
um, and thinking about what is the best possible way? How do we understand what's available in this region? Um, and how can that come to play here? So we started to just go like piece by piece. What if we start with the wall exterior um, and insulation systems? Um, and we just started doing the research of understanding how straw bales are um, used to create buildings. What are the different types of bales that are available? What could we grow here? How much space would it take to do this? This first building that they wanted to implement is the shop, um, which is both a place where they kind of repair all of their uh, tractors and equipment um, and then also have their offices. And so we kind of tried to understand how much of their farming would they have to turn over um, to bales if they wanted to do straw bale construction and turn out to be about 25 acres and they own, they have about 1100 acres. So um, would be a very small area of their total. Um, what if what if they started to use livestock and looked at using insulation? How many sheep would they have to have um, over what area of space to produce uh, enough enough wool over a certain limited period of time to actually do the insulation out of wool. And then trying to understand how that compares and you know what is the cost? How do we understand each of these materials? Not just the embodied carbon, but we have to balance that with all these other inputs. You know, is it a good insulation value? Is it a cost that is bearable by this partner or in general? Um, can we get it somewhere nearby? What does it cost to ma maintain? Um, and what is its lifespan? So really trying to not just look at one metric, but try to understand the opportunities across the board. Um, and then again, this is just kind of trying to uncover what these resources might be locally. So it could be that this could be the first carbon positive campus in the region, um, proving that you can use straw bales to build in a viable way. And then um, I did do that one pretty quickly. So I'm gonna take one more minute because it's 9 or two at least where I am. <laughs> and I'm just gonna talk quickly about this Iljan Charles project um, because it, it, it's quite similar. It's a lot of the same lessons, but I think um, learning how, we, how to work with indigenous communities was another um, um, shift in the way that we were working between Rwanda and here and something that was very unique to being in this part of the world. Um, the Trail of Tears is uh, when the, um, uh, Choctaw and other Indians were removed and in this case came down to southern Mississippi, I'm sorry, southern Louisiana and created their homes here on the Ildijan Charles band um, of the Biloxi, Chitmacha and Choctaw um, rather than going all the way to Oklahoma. And it began on Ildijan Charles, which at the time was 34 square miles, but because of and due to um, uh, oil extraction um, and climate change and, and rising waters, 98% of their land has been lost since the 1950s. And so almost the entire community other than maybe four or five or six people and families have relocated into other areas. Um, these are views of what, of what remains. Um, and it's totally inaccessible during any kind of um, high water, but um, um, is accessible still by one, one single road. Um, and so the question was, you know, this was no longer going to be a place where people could live and the community knew that even in the 80s and started to think about how they would relocate. They now live in a diaspora condition where everyone has a safe place to live, but they are no longer nearby each other. Um, and, and some people are even hours away. And so the big question was, how do we both kind of preserve um, this culture? How do we relocate an entire community to a new site? They won the HUD grant for 54 million to build all new housing. Um, which went through another process, um, which was not successful. And so that, that hasn't come to fruition. And so what we were working on was how do we create a kind of cultural lifeways center where the kind of knowledge and history of living on that very, very special place of Ildizan Charles could still be a part of their day-to-day -day living, could still be a resource that they could share with their future generations. Um, and also just be a place to kind of hold all of their artifacts, which otherwise, you know, had been taken by the state. And so these could be relocated here um, and be a, be a part of the community and, and a resource for them. So while that other project was happening, um, we were thinking about this part of this LifeWays Resource Center that could happen right here. And we worked with um, these other groups that had actually been part of the team that won the um, HUD project, but then um, didn't win the RFP that was run by the state. And we created a toolkit, which is around the idea of how, when you're working with communities that are gonna be relocated due to climate change, what are, what are some things that must be kept in mind? How do you have a process that um, allows it to be community led uh, and, and also focuses on the preservation, not only of um, 
like a place to live safely, but also on the culture that supports that community. And so these are some of the things that we learned from the community mostly and from the team that had been working with them for so long. The idea of the declaration of principles, what the MOU might look like, um, narrative case studies, uh, uh, and we included things like the cross boundary network and logic model, and I'll go into some of those. Um, one of them is this memorandum of understanding, this idea that we, as anyone working on this project and designing with the community, sign this understanding that um, all of the work that came out of it, all of the intellectual property, which is the culture that was shared as a, as a, uh, in it, to inform how the design um, would be created, was the was owned by uh, and and subject to um, direction from the tribe in terms of how it would be used, um, both during and after the project. Um, declaration of principles of how we would work together: openness and honesty, clear communication, flexibility, consideration of time. And none of these things were considered in the other project, uh, the fifty-four million project about their homes. And in fact. Um, was really uh, really challenging in terms of the way that they interacted with the community, which is why in the end it, it, it ended in failure, which is, is, is totally heartbreaking for this community because it was a, such an opportunity for them to relocate together. Um, and so the idea is that this toolkit, this way of working could then be distributed to all these other locations as you see here, where, where these, are, these things are gonna start to happen you know, throughout our country and throughout um, our hemisphere and across the world and, and how might some of the learnings from this process be shared. How do we think about memorialization of a lost heritage of a place that we must be leaving to go to a new place that's safer? How do we think about regeneration of likely ecologies in new places so that we can keep those histories alive and allow them to change and adapt to new places? How do we continue lifeways? And how do we educate future generations? But I think, I mean, all of this was informing of how, like the program that we were gonna have there, what might the landscape look like, but we also wanted to do the same question of understanding and uncovering the possibilities and potentials of this community to build their own uh, to build their own lifeway center to it, um, actually implement this amazing project and this this project has lived on the water I mean sorry this community has lived on the water for over a hundred years um, and started with dugouts in the pre-1900s and then have moved to pirogues rowboats um, and now are some of the most high tech and amazing shipbuilders in the world. They're building um, icebreakers that go into the Arctic. Um, they're doing uh, all of these things. And so they have high, high, high skill levels. And so one of the things that we looked at is how can we take that skill set? How can we take that amazing knowledge um, and apply it to the construction process? And so that's where we are with that. And just one example I wanted to share of, of how we can uncover these amazing skill sets in our local communities. So that's it. Thank you. I went over by like five minutes, I think, but really. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Sierra, what an inspiring presentation. Um, so graphically beautiful and absolutely stunning designs. Um, thank you so much for sharing. Um, I can speak for myself here, but I um, could have listened to you for at least another hour. Um, really. Terrific. Thank you so much. And I wish you could hear the roaring applause in the audience now, because I am certain we all felt the same way. Um, at the beginning of this session, we talked a bit about Hawaii, Rwanda, and the, uh, the, the uh, similarities. Um, you mentioned uh, the sourcing of um, materials uh, locally. Would you mind going a bit into where you feel the uh, the similarities and um, opportunities are similarities between uh, between Rwanda and uh, Hawaii and where the opportunities for us here in Hawaii are? Yeah, you know, as as we were talking before, I mean, I think one of the things that, as I was speaking with members of the AIA to kind of understand what we be most interesting for you all to hear considering the topic of, of this meeting and, and all of the work that's being done there um, was this idea that how do we build you know again in the face of climate change and as we understand how carbon is working more and more how do we build locally when you know in Rwanda we're a landlocked country um, where we have we have some resources there but we don't have all the typical resources that we consider to be kind of modern building um, uh, materials like uh, reinforced 
uh, steel, rebar, um, concrete. You know, in Rwanda, they now are doing recycling to make rebar. There's a little tiny bit. I think they have like 2% of the concrete that they utilize annually can, can be made in country. So everything's really being imported there. Um, and I think, you know, Hawaii, similarly, not a landlocked country, but certainly an island far, far out in, in the Pacific. And so similar challenges with the costs, both carbon costs, but also, um, you know, monetarily of, of the need to import all of those or many of those materials are, are having, you know, fewer resources locally. And, and so I think what I've heard um, in speaking with people is that there is this kind of um, bringing to bear of um, engineering, um, all of our allied professions kind of working together to look at and understand what those resources are and how do we utilize them and how do we understand how we might need to build differently. It might not be according to the same kinds of uh, building uh, guidelines and codes that we've had before and how do we kind of begin to question and adjust those and, and, and kind of un, un, discover and um, work through those systems, um, the materials that are on hand. Uh, and so I, as I understand that similar things are happening there in terms of forestry, um, in terms of uh, other locally, locally sourced like stones and materials. And, and I don't know enough about Hawaii to be able to kind of understand in detail what all of those opportunities are, but, um, but certainly it's such an amazing and rich country. And so it'll be interesting to see how you guys um, work, work that. We should continue this, this dialogue um, after this conference. I, I certainly would love that. And I have a, well, I usually try to ask big picture questions. I'm going to go down a rabbit hole now uh, because when I prepared for this session, I did some research on Rwanda <laughs> and I uh, found out that uh, you have uh, Albizia trees down there. Mm -hmm. Now, we have them here too, and they are invasive. And mm -hmm. we are looking for ways to... Um, use them mm -hmm. in new projects. Now, they are a particularly soft type of wood. Um, structurally, they're a bit of a challenge. Um, do you have any examples of what you have used Albizia for mm -hmm. in Rwanda? Is there anything? Uh, we've been... Uh... Albizia, we have looked at for use um, for furnishing. Okay. And we've tested mm -hmm. it out on some of, I mean, as you can see, I mean, the, the tables and chairs that were made there um, were, are just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, and so I think we looked at treatments of it that um, allow it to, um, while it is soft, um, you know, I think some, I don't know it, I don't know Albizia like um, very, very well having, I haven't woodworked with it and with my own hands, but um, poplar is another tree that is, good but but does have kind of um, tendencies towards being soft it it's like a little bit um, pulpy um, you could say but but I think what we tried to do is find ways that we could use other um, treatments that added to its hardness and added to its like slickness as a furnishing material and so instead of um, using like we would just actually experiment and, and using like an oil treatment rather than like a urethane sanding it after rather than sanding it before and just over time and testing and testing coming up with ways that it actually ends up functioning well um so that's what we found mostly is, is furnishing but i can check with our engineers and see if we found anything else <laughs> i didn't i didn't mean to stump you with it, it it's just it, i thought okay i i should ask yeah, yeah, yeah. um we have only about five minutes left and i have to make a decision um which question i gonna go with here now um, and I'll, I'll ask you the, the visionary one moving forward. Uh, consider your audience. We're all architects. Mm -hmm. um, so um, great opportunity for a call for action. Where would you like to see our profession go? Um, you're so inspiring. I mean, what would you say to somebody that caught fire and I think, okay, how many people are in here? Exactly a hundred. I think there's a hundred people here that caught fire. And now what's the next step? Oh, I guess I, the two things that I'm most 
inspired and excited by now, which they each of them, well, and there's always kind of the, the hard side, which is, you know, where we're in response to, uh, we're, we're living right now in a time when we have to respond to a, a very slow mo moving crisis. And so how do we make that urgency feel, um, how do we feel that day to day? Um, and, uh, and then how do we find our way out of it? How do we find a way to work? And the ways that I've, I think are so exciting right now is that we have to be thinking together with all of our disciplines. We have to like break down the boundaries between architecture, landscape, engineering. I think what I loved so much about working on the, the project, the RECA project, and which is now like informing all of our other projects is that we work so closely with our engineering team internally even and it just allowed us so much flexibility to like ask the questions and figure out the answers in a very short time and with a really tight feedback. And, I, and, and so just kind of working more fluidly between disciplines, I think is gonna help us a lot. And I would say the other thing is that, are there two other things? As a landscape architect, I think our relationship to nature is changing forever. Nature is this thing that we've always thought of as this boundless resource. And in fact, if it is going to remain intact, either to support it through agriculture or uh, and ecology um, or to preserve the kind of just diversity and beauty of the world that we live in and in fact allow our earth to be livable going forward, every square meter and square foot of what we have has to be determined and thoughtfully um, kept uh, functioning through design. Um, and so that means, I think it's at every scale. It's at the scale of front yards and backyards, the residential places. It's at the scale of cities. It's, it's the medians that we have between highways. And, and then it's also obviously at the scale of the land that is, you know, either agricultural or untouched or at this regional scale. But all of that we need to think of. And in, in a place like Hawaii, which has these very clear bounds, you know, um, it's finite, you know, what we can obtain from this land is finite. We have to be really thoughtful about that. Um, and I think it's a whole different way of thinking than, than we have had before. And then I would say um, the last thing is that I, I think we actually can get to a point where what we do is not destructive, but is totally restorative, that it is productive, that we can do things without harm. And I think we don't realize, we haven't realized until now how much harm we do, how a simple decision that we make can actually have negative impacts somewhere along its supply chain. But now that we have that knowledge, how do we, how do we design differently? How do we um, get to a place where we can actually have no harm in each of those decisions? Um, and it's kind of about taking it apart and thinking about materials on the first day of design, not, not halfway through. You are certainly giving us so much to think about now. Sierra, I um, have Jim up there. I think that is a very subtle indication that um, we need to wrap, to wrap it up. Thank you so much. It was wonderful, wonderful. Um, it is, uh, yeah, very, it was very inspiring. Um, thank, you. thank you so much for having me. I wish I could have been there in person, of course, um, but I'm so glad you all had a great uh, couple of days and hopefully some of it's recorded. I would love to go in and watch and thanks for having me. You're very welcome. I believe everything is recorded. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty certain we can uh, give you access to this. Um, I would not be doing my job if I did not thank um, our sponsors here. Um, again, um, we would not be able to do any of this if it wasn't for you. So thank you very, very much. Um, so in closing, I hope that you not only enjoyed this session here, but the um, entire day and yesterday's session. Um, we do have a couple of uh, important announcements that we would like to make before you leave. So if you wouldn't mind sticking around for a couple more minutes, I'd like to welcome back our incoming AIA Honolulu president, Jim Niccolo. Jim, floor's yours. Thank you so much, Bettina. And I'm gonna ask you to stay on camera for a second as well, because you're part of our, our special surprise. 
But I also want to thank you, Sierra, and, and encourage everyone to just since we can't, she can't hear us applauding. You know, put a nice note in the chat. I see them. I see them coming in. That was a really amazing and inspiring presentation, and just a great way to finish what's been a wonderful couple of days together. Um, with that, before we close the event, I'd like to do a special surprise presentation, and I want to ask um, AIA Honolulu Board Director and DNA Committee member Melanie Islam to join us on stage. Hi, everyone. First of all, I just want to say happy birthday, Patina. Um, I know you celebrated your birthday yesterday, and we just wanted to uh, just give you some birthday shout outs from the community. Um, as you've all probably noticed, sustainability, green building, and climate responsive design has been a reoccurring theme throughout DNA. One of the reasons we invited Patina to moderate our sessions is because of her lasting and important work in this area. As a sustainably focused community business leader who runs a firm that has been recognized as one of the top 100 green firms in the country, Patina has spent a lifetime advocating for strong resiliency policies, particularly as it relates to the design and building industries. For the past three years, Patina has served as one of five commissioners on the Honolulu Climate Change Commission, not just advocating for, but researching and drafting policies that impact all of our futures. She recently completed her term, and I was recently appointed to see her on the commission, so she has some really big shoes to fill. Um, but I bring all of this up because it has been a while since AI Honolulu recognized one of our own, and so we want to take this time and this opportunity to acknowledge someone who has given a lot, not just to architecture and the profession, but more broadly to the local community by way of her passion and enthusiasm for sustainable design. Athena. Mahalo for your leadership and fierce commitment to sustainability. Thank you for always wearing your climate action hat, whether it is for advocating for the use of new technologies and building design or promoting the AIA to better promote the framework for design excellence. In recognition of all your important work in these areas over the many, many years, AIA Honolulu is proud to award you the 2021 Climate Action Advocate Award. I'm going to share with you an image of this. I hope you guys can see it. This award was handcrafted and donated in kind by GPRM Pre-Stress, and with the concrete provided by the Island Ready Mix and infused with carbon cure technology. We'd like to thank these companies for assisting us with this one of a kind award. Patina, it is my honor to present this award to you, recognizing you as AA Honolulu's 2021 Climate Action Advocate. Congratulations. I don't know what to say. This is possibly one of the biggest honors um, because I wouldn't do anything if it wasn't for the people around me. And there is a, there's a passion in all of us. The fact that we have this conference, these amazing speakers and this audience is, terrific and I believe we can all we can make a difference we owe it to the next generation and I am just humbled beyond words for this recognition and it just makes me try even harder um, I have to say I am I'm looking for words it doesn't happen often and I am incredibly humbled so thank you Melanie thank you everybody at the the AIA that had something to do with this. Um, I don't take any of this lightly and I'm fueled. My fire is. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. We're gonna meet up and give you the award too. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Melanie. Thank you and congr congratulations, Bettina. Um, finally, I, I hope you'll all join me in thanking JC for her tenure as our chapter VP. Uh, we will miss you, JC. Today is her last day. I think under her leadership, we've seen a huge increase in sponsorship. Um, we've seen a, a successful pivot as a chapter into a global pandemic and shifting, <laughs> shifting to all virtual existence. Um, and we've seen uh, her kind of come up with the idea for this particular conference. So we'll really miss you, JC, and really appreciate all that you've done. I also hope you'll join me in uh, today's JC's last day. So I hope you also join me in welcoming our new chapter EVP, Julia Fink. 
Uh, Julia's uh, already actually started this week, so we could have some overlap in training. We'll be sharing out more information about uh, about Julia in the coming weeks, and you'll have opportunity to meet her. I hope you all make her make her feel welcome. But we're super excited about the energy and expertise she'll bring to uh, to serving as chapter EVP. And then finally, a huge mahalo to everyone who's uh, been participating in this conference for the, pa the past couple of days. I wanna thank all of you for your attention and, and, and passion and the energy you bring to the, the design community. I wanna offer a big mahalo to Brittany McLean from Source and thank all of our sponsors uh, for DNA. It's your support that allows us to do this and bring this to our members and keep it affordable. So we really couldn't do it without them. I want to offer a special thank you to our team for helping us put together a great event. You know, we had COVID uh, requirements changing live as we were planning, and I think they've really managed to pull off a very successful conference. I want to thank all of our speakers and moderators, our AIA Honolulu staff and the planning committee. So JC, Camilla, Alyssa, Melanie Islam, Jill Masawa, Elise Takashige, Christian Makute, Karen Sakamoto and uh, Sakamoto and and uh, my name's on here too, but I, I did very little. So I appreciate each and everybody else who did all did all the hard work. I want to thank our event planners, uh, Prestige Events, Mary and Ryan, the AIA Board of Directors, and and now I'm the only thing standing between you and and Pauhana. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thank you.